Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Scale Up Stateside show, where today I'm going to be chatting with an industry expert when it comes to marketing and building your brand. And we'll be focusing our conversation on what that looks like for the US staffing market. For those of us who haven't joined us before, I am Amy Davies, Managing Director of PGC Group, and we specialize in supporting recruiters expanding their business to the US and also in providing employer of record services for their contractors and clients. Today, joining me is Darren Westall, CEO of PayJet, very well known in the UK recruitment industry space. Darren founded PayJet in 2018 and the platform helps recruiters build personal brands. It helps identify new business opportunities. It also helps to attract candidates and have better conversations. Since it launched in 2018, the platform's been recognized with several awards, including APSCO's Innovation of the Year Award and the Tiara Talent Tech Marketing Solution of the Year Award. But why have we got Darren, a marketing expert, on our Scale Up Stateside podcast today? Well, last year, Darren expanded PayJet to the US and has built a great customer base out there. He has seen first hand, both through himself and also through his sales team, some of the differences between marketing your business here in the UK versus marketing the business over in the US. And today he's going to be sharing with us some of those insights and some of the golden nuggets with us all. So after a pretty long introduction, you can tell I'm excited about this one. Hello, Darren, and welcome to our Scale Up Stateside podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, I know. I've been really excited about this one. Many of you listening, either live or listening back to this via our podcast channels, will know that we've moved this slightly back. And Darren, you've not been too well, so you feel better today and ready for the session? I am. There might be a few coughs. Uh, my voice seems to go up and down. It's like when I used to answer the register at school and sometimes I'd be... <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah, so, yeah, apologies. Chest infection. Still getting over it, but nearly there now. Oh, no, well, I appreciate you joining us uh, and hopefully you'll be back to 100% soon. You probably sound like my 13-year-old son right now when we're having conversations with him at home. Um, thank you, Darren. I'm really like it. Sometimes it goes really deep, you know, so okay. thank you. There we go. At least the audience know before we kick off. Um, but seriously, yeah, thanks so much for joining us today. We've got a packed agenda to get through in just 30 minutes um, and we're going to be covering a little bit around kind of what you've done with PayJet and um, how you've taken it now to the US and what are the differences you've seen um, and before we kind of go into lots of that detail in the crux of today's session I'm also going to talk through kind of PGC's advice on how to market your business and um, in terms of doing that initially from the UK before you potentially land and expand your business in the US. Now, if anyone has any questions specific to your business or your current circumstances that you would like answering in today's session, as always, please drop them in the chat and comment function and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can without distracting from the agenda set before us. If we don't get time to answer your questions, we will come back to you after the episode is finished. Either myself or Darren will reach out and make sure that we get your questions answered. So let's just kick off, Darren. It'd just be great for everybody listening if we could just hear a little bit about your background and in particular, why you went on to found Pager. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've been in recruitment for oh, 16, 17 years, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, way too long. Um, but I've never been a recruiter. I, I'm a tech guy through and through. I love technology. I love marketing. Um, so straight out of college where I ironically found IT somehow I got a job as a software developer, junior software developer at Broadbean Technology. Um, yeah. I think the CTO was off that day when I interviewed, so I got lucky. <laughs> uh, but I, it was 10 years, so I worked my way out of the career ladder at Broadbean and became their chief technology officer across EMEA, so I was responsible for their product and technical teams. I was, you know, at the top of my career ladder, if you like. I was 28 years old. My wife was very happy, um, but I was bloody miserable. So mm-hmm. I went home and said, I'm going to quit my job. My wife said, don't you dare, but to be in the school, <laughs> I did it anyway. Uh, and that's not a reflection on Broadbin. I must say that it was a brilliant company. It's just, I'm a person that needs to have a goal, right? And when you've achieved yeah. your goals, at such an early stage, you just, what's next? What's next? Yeah. And for me, the obvious thing was start a business. See, I always wanted to run my own business. I did pass business at college, just not IT. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, started Pager and 
the reason Paddy just started was because I spent so long looking at people's LinkedIn profiles. And the only thing I saw them talking about was the fact they had a job. I'm hiring for this. I'm hiring for that. At no point did they actually deliver any value to people on that platform. And I knew LinkedIn was going to go from a job board, which is what they were you know, when I first yeah. launched, yeah. to be mm -hmm. a real marketing channel. So, yeah, I saw the opportunity and I'm glad I did because, like you say, we now work with hundreds of recruitment agency staff and agencies. And my wife's finally forgiven me for quitting my job. That's what <laughs> Win win. I remember Darren. The first time I bumped into you was at the Rec Expo in Birmingham. Um, I, I think I was looking for my car in the car park. Yeah, uh, this was in 2021. I'd not long joined PGC, and I felt like I bumped into a celebrity at that point because no one was really doing much on LinkedIn. I was like, "Oh my word, Darren!" And you're like, "Yeah, who are you?" Uh, yeah. And I felt like I already knew you. Uh, and it's really funny actually because. For PGC, we've got a lot of strong uh, personal brands that are built very organically through the platform as well. Um, and obviously, we know the page platform really well too. Um, so it's kind of be here three years on, coming full circle and having this conversation is really exciting. Um, just I'd also just love for our audience here, maybe since you launched Pager in 2018, what are some of the successes that you've had you know, with the platform? Yeah, I mean, there's so there's so many, right? It's gone way beyond my expectations when I first started. Um, you know, from the likes, that, how can I work? We work with nearly a thousand staffing agencies, right? So that's for me wow. is a massive win. Um, but yeah. if you talk about what impact have we had on the industry, which I think is almost more important, when we first started, people didn't post on LinkedIn, right? They didn't, yeah. and actually, marketing as a whole was seen as a cost center rather than revenue generated. And mm -hmm. I'd like to add a real play in actually changing that perception um i think that we fast forwarded the way, the way marketing is perceived in the industry they realize now that actually having a good website driving traffic to that website having inbound conversations is much better than making 200 phone calls a day and having yeah. to stand on your chair right well, i feel like we've come a long long way as an industry right? a long long way uh, and marketing and what the biggest thing i'm proud of is that marketing for me has now got a seat at the table when it comes to the boardroom uh, and i like yeah. to think we played a small part in that Oh, so yeah, it's always kind of that value you're adding to the wider industry, not just through kind of your own products. I totally, totally uh, get that and see that. Um, okay, right. Well, let's get into the conversation. So a lot of you will have joined today because, um, you know, perhaps you are accessing the US market currently from the UK. Um, but often it's a question that we get asked a lot about as we have early expansion calls with staffing directors or recruitment founders is really how do we go about marketing our business when we're based in the UK and we know that we want to target and tap into the US market. And we always really start talking to um, these businesses about you know kind of two distinct routes that they can choose from. We have the recruit from afar model and then we have the land and expand model. Um, both very uh, obvious what each one is about but recruit from afar if you if you don't know is where you would initially start in your home country which for our audience would be the UK and you would start to tap into that market using your UK kind of cost base and to kind of test and see is there a bite there from the market for your proposition and being able to generate and show kind of that early kind of competency to generate revenue from the market before you would then go and land and expand with formal office presence and presence over there in the States. And a lot of people like to do the recruit from afar model first, just because it's kind of got a lot of reduced risk to that model. And it's relatively low cost because you would utilize your existing kind of operational costs to test that out. And because ultimately this is a tried and tested a um, way of accessing it and you can also use your internal talent that you already have that you know maybe you're a great biller and go and use them and try them in the US market and um, so a lot of people will start that and when you think about how do I start and where do I go with this from a marketing perspective I could talk about kind of the business side the operational side but we'll save that for other episodes because today is focused on marketing and um, normally um, what you'll find in the US recruitment market is that it's dominated by large recruitment firms. And all of those, um, or certainly a lot of those large recruitment firms are largely generic in terms of they can serve kind of any industry, any role. 
And it's really left a gap in the market, a niche focused recruitment firms to launch and thrive. And that's definitely something when we see recruitment firms really bottom down on being very niche in the US market, where we've seen those businesses have large success very early on. So the five key questions really uh, that you would probably want to ask yourself when you're choosing your target market and looking at that proposition um, is what is going to be your niche? So what will that niche be? So when we talk about niche, you know, you may say, okay, I am going to go into the finance sector and I am just going to recruit fractional CFOs. So it's, it's, a, it's a drilled down niche from not just an industry, but to a role as well. Um, and you can do that across other things. So you might say, okay, I'm going to go into the IT space and I'm only going to recruit workday consultants that are being provided to HR teams across the US. So thinking about kind of what your niche is going to be. Then looking at, is there already a leader in that niche? Because if, if there is, you might want to look to tweak the proposition. Or do you have that first mover advantage? So in the state that you're looking at, and I'll come on to uh, the states in just a moment, do you have that first mover advantage in there? Thirdly, is the market large enough to grow your business and to scale that business? So is there enough market? We know there is in the US as a whole, but in the state that you're selected and in that niche, is there a demand for those types of candidates over there? And lastly, can you control the supply of those candidates? We know um, after that, but remote work is very popular in the US um, and still is this day. And that clients are still happy to kind of do video meetings and calls. But we would always suggest that once you've kind of nailed that proposition and that niche, that you need to go over to start to see those clients face to face and start to build those relationships before stepping back and delivering your model from the UK. So that's just a little bit about niche and proposition. You also will should think about your target market. So what state is it that you're going to start to build traction from? And we would always advise to start with one state and to build it out from there. When we say start with one state, what we're really saying with that is start with one state where your target clients exist and look at states where you've got kind of the highest concentration of your target clients. So if that, um, you know, happened to be Texas, then you would look at Texas and you would maybe even drill down further on locations within Texas. Because again, when you look at the size of Texas, kind of four times bigger than the UK alone. So again, just understanding the size of what you're dealing with and being able to appropriately choose a state. Now, again, always link that back to your proposition. So where are my target clients? Where also can my candidates be provided remotely or are my candidates going to be provided on site? Because again, you might then be led, if the answer to that second question was yes, you might then be led by the talent in terms of choosing your target market. Just to give you an idea of some of the states and where we're seeing kind of the largest um, states by sector, um, we know that um, California and Texas are hubs for IT um, or tech-based roles. We know that um, Florida and actually a lot of the East Coast of New York, Chicago, Illinois, is very popular for life science roles um, and particularly finance roles as well. And then we typically see um, three of the larger states, uh, California, New York, and Texas being very popular for marketing-based roles as well. If you want any more detail on any of those states and just the size of those markets, particularly looking at what your industry and niche roles are, please feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn and I can talk that through in more detail because I don't have any more time to be able to go through that. But essentially, it's really important to think about the different states. And Darren, just from your experience of um, going to the US and being able to generate clients there, um, what has been your experience of seeing what the key differences are between marketing a recruitment business in the UK versus marketing it in the US? First of all, I'd echo everything you just said. I think it's fantastic advice, and you know the fact that's for free is incredible. So hands off to it. Um, <laughs> the biggest biggest thing for me is for us to remember that as UK recruiters, we are exceptional. Right? We are for me, we are mm -hmm. the best in the business. Right now, if you're listening to Australia, sorry, but we are. Right now, 
the key thing is to remember that and replicate what we do in the UK in, in the US because in the US, I don't think actually they are the best recruiters. And that's going to be a bit of a controversial statement, but you know, that's the reality. So people are more generalist and they haven't invested in their website as much as we have. The technology stack's not as not as um, mature. So actually all of the great things you're doing in the UK, I just want you to take and do in the US, but remember that it's a very different market. One of the biggest things people seem to get very excited about is the size of the market, right? And it's huge. It's absolutely huge. But please don't let that be a distraction. You need to pick a really, really small part and now that part, and then you can scout up from there. You know, when I first started, the idea was to work with really small recruiting businesses. I wasn't going to go straight for your Adecos, your Randstats, right? Mm. It's the same thing with the US. So you need to you need to literally pick your part. And I think you mentioned about being really niche. I think that's our superpower, right? It really is. Mm-hmm. Also investing in your marketing stack. So for me, the differences as well is the setup internally. We're typically 360. That doesn't really exist um, over the yeah. over states. So yeah. automatically, you've got a decision. Do I want to try and replicate what the market does out there? Or actually, am I going to take what we do in the UK and make it work there? I don't think there's a right answer for that, except for if you've got somebody with exceptional ability, I would be backing them to go and do that there as, as well. Um, so for me, the big difference is we've got a mature tech stack. We've got a really good website. We've got the right source of traffic, if you like. And that is your advantage over some of the American staffing agencies. Yeah, definitely. And I think um, I once heard someone, um, quite a large age, successful UK agency that now gone over to the US and they've got a very large presence across nine different states there. And then their main kind of managing director over there said, you know, you really need to start by building your client, your candidate pipeline, because if you haven't got a candidate pipeline, you haven't got a product to necessarily sell into your US based clients. And so when we think about growing out a candidate pipeline, in the US, um, what would be your advice on that? And how would you, um, what advice would you give, particularly just from that marketing standpoint in terms of where they would start, how recruiters can kind of start to build a presence online um, to be able to attract candidates to them? Yeah, I mean, the big thing is LinkedIn. So LinkedIn should be your shop center, if you like, your your storefront. And so many people yeah. neglect their profile. So the first thing I'd do is give yourself a full profile review. You know, my banner, is my banner actually saying what I do? Is my headline yeah. handy? Make sure your profile actually drives people to actually work with your brand. Because once you do that, you've then got your center point that's going to lead from LinkedIn to your website. And then it's all about how do I get people to view my LinkedIn profile? How do I become that trusted person? Uh, you mentioned that you saw me at the Rec Expo, right? And you knew who I was. That's your yeah. goal in the US, right? That is ultimately your goal. How do I get people to know who I am without physically knowing who I am? So for me, yeah. I'd look at LinkedIn, I'd say, right, my niche is going to be, I think you mentioned um, like doubling down on your niche, so not just IT, you need to go further. So I'm going yeah. to recruit more Python developers that specialize in machine learning only within San Francisco, right? That's that's my niche. And that is who I'm going to write content for on LinkedIn. That's who I'm yeah. going to position up as the expert in. So my LinkedIn profile talks to them, my website talks to them, and then my LinkedIn content does as well. And yeah. I go one step further to that is if you want to talk to these people, you need to embed yourself in the communities and build up their trust. So I'd be searching every single day for LinkedIn posts by candidate, LinkedIn posts by hiring managers in that space. And I'd be commenting, adding value to their posts, whether that's on LinkedIn or it could be Reddit, it could be Hacker News. Find out where they hang out and be part of that community. And you don't yeah. need to go where to do Right, you don't have to go there. Hacker news in the tech industry is the place to be. Yet recruiters don't hang out there, even though every single month there's a thread that says who wants to be hired, and people put in there, "I want to be hired. This is my skill set. This is my salary. This is my location." Yet we're not hanging out in these places. So we're we're trying to do the same thing, not embracing community. And you don't need to be there to be part of the community. You just need to put the time in and investment. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely love that. And yeah, every part of what you just said completely rings true, especially that be part of the community. And I think, like I spoke about, once you understand your proposition, you've got your niche, you've got your target audience, like go and find your audience and then start building all the content so that audience sees it and associate what your niche is with you, that you're the leader in that niche. So totally love that and kind of validates everything we're seeing. 
just in terms of then using Pager um, to be able to do that, what have, what success have you seen for your US clients in using Pager um, serving that kind of domestic US market? Yeah, I mean, we purposely don't work with generalist recruiters. We just can't because Pager's designed to do what I just said. It's designed yeah. to take you to be the expert in your niche. And if you don't have a niche, yeah. you just you can't use it. So the yeah. idea behind Pager is every single day, you get content suggestions, whether that's AI written for you, like a first draft or curated mm-hmm. podcasts, YouTube channels, news webs, news articles, and you take that content and you make it your own for your community, right? So your mm-hmm. LinkedIn for maybe you're sharing it elsewhere, maybe you're sharing your jobs as well. But you need to, again, decide your niche and then train Pager. Pager's almost like an assistant, if you like. If everybody in your business could have their own mm-hmm. marketers, that would be Pager. Obviously, you can't afford to do that by scaling people. It's just not possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ideally, if you do that, give everyone a resource first and then then a marketing system. Right? So <laughs> we don't, Pager can fill that marketing gap where every person at desk level actually has an assistant. So that's what we do. You can do it without Pager. Absolutely, you can, right? Sometimes our favorite clients are the ones that are doing it already because you, yeah. you actually know what I mean. So by mm-hmm. all means, do try posting every single day, be consistent, find the content, write the content, and then, uh, yeah, normally you'd get someone like Pagers, it needs to be Pager, to actually make you more efficient. We're all about driving efficiency across the business. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the other kind of key points with this, and it's definitely a challenge that um, a lot of businesses come up against, is just time zones and being able to operate um, the US time zone from the UK um, and really considering how you go about doing that. And Pager can help them with that in terms of scheduling posts and content, can't it? Yeah, with marketing, there's no there's no reason to to worry about time zones, right? Because in the US in particular, what we're saying is the afternoons are their mornings, right? So yeah. I want you to start commenting on people's posts in your afternoon, but you can mm-hmm. write your content in the morning. You can schedule that yeah. for the evening. You know, you can be around. One thing I would say is you need to be around to respond back to comments. You know, there's something called the mm-hmm. golden two hours where you need to make sure you yeah. engage back to comments. So if you schedule your post for, say, 6 p.m., all I'm asking you to do is have your phone available at, you know, five to seven, respond to a few comments to make sure you maximize it. So time zones shouldn't be an issue when it comes to marketing on the likes of LinkedIn, but even emails can be scheduled. Your email automations can be all scheduled, yes. right? So for me, the time zone isn't an excuse for top of the funnel activity. Your top of the no. funnel activity can be done during your working hours in the UK, um, but you need to obviously then follow up middle of the funnel and, and closing. That's mm-hmm. where you need to go hours but marketing shouldn't be one of the reasons for you to be staying up late yeah and that middle and bottom of the funnel activity kind of for recruitment businesses their golden hours to be able to do that is our afternoon americans morning in terms of catching them early in their day it's funny because how you just described it it's almost like my day because i have a u.s team and a uk team my mornings i do a lot of planning uh, and kind of any sort of concentration work while speaking to the uk team as well before the US team and our US clients are all online from 2 p.m. onwards. And then my day becomes quite transactional uh, in terms of lots of conversations. So it's probably very, very similar in terms of how um, a recruiter who's targeting that US market can utilize their day as well. Yeah, definitely. Just split it, right? It's almost like a Monday morning. On a Monday morning, nobody wants to hear from our sales team, right? If we cold called you on a Monday morning, I think you'd tell us to Fox Troll Oscar, right? So. <laughs> It's all then in that time. That's where you schedule your posts. That's where you write your posts. That's where you do all these great things. So everybody's yeah. got that downtime. Everybody's got that time where it's not the right time to be talking to clients and candidates. It's about mm-hmm. using that time wisely. And as I say, using tools out there to make you more efficient during that time as well so you can get more done. Yeah. Would you? What would you say for all the little tips such as, um sure you pull up against this um, when you've been working with American clients, but I was like American grammar, um, so if you're doing this from the UK, you know, kind of talking to your audience in the way that they would read words or how things would be spelt. Um, just is that what you've come across as well with working with US clients? Yeah, obviously you need to put the Z rather than the S's, right? Um, <laughs> with our platform, it takes care of it for you so you can choose your, your language. But it's just important <laughs> for the, the nuances and certain things don't always resonate. Like the fact we're saying recruitment agencies, actually they're not staffing agencies. Uh-huh. There's lots of mm-hmm. things that you need to just remember. Um, it becomes second nature though. Once you've done it for a month, honestly, it becomes second yeah. nature. Mm-hmm. You'll find yourself using it in the UK market. You'll say the wrong words. Uh-huh. That's, that's more of the problem. So 
That's I, my I life. <laughs> and also, it's again, think of your your superpower, right? People, they they love speaking to us, right? They do. Mm-hmm. Most most of the American people I speak to love our accent, even though I you know over here I'm an Essex boy. Nobody wants to talk to an Essex boy, but actually in America <laughs> they do. You know, so use it to your advantage. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't ever say that. You know, if you if you spell something in English rather than American, it's going to stop a deal from happening. Right? It's yeah. not going to stop, especially if you're upfront with it and say, "Look, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm British, so yeah, I did." Mm-hmm. You know, I wouldn't get too caught up on the details. I think as a human race, we we always build things up in our minds to be bigger than what they are. I'm going to be judged mm-hmm. for this. I couldn't possibly mm-hmm. post a video on LinkedIn. People will comment about X, Y, Z. It doesn't happen. So yeah. I would just, yeah. just <laughs> get over it. You made the odd mistake, but it really won't matter. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Just to finish off, Darren, I can't believe it. We've got three minutes left. Um, but if we just um, finish off by asking you one final question is if you could offer our audience listening today one piece of advice to build their personal brand in the US market, what would it be and why? Biggest thing is just get started. So I speak to so many people all the time. They say, oh, but I'm worried about X, Y, Z, or <clears throat> if I post this, um, what will what will they say? Just get started. The reality is, you know, nobody knows what's going to happen until it happens. And mm-hmm. people don't care as much as you think they care, right? So yeah. only that video is the best type of content on LinkedIn. We just spoke about this, right? My first video on LinkedIn probably took me half an hour to record it and end up with a 30-second clip. All that happened was a lot of support, encouragement, and now I post video pretty much every single day. So the biggest piece of advice is just get started. Don't overthink yeah. things. And I promise you, it will, it will all work out in, in the right way. Yeah. I speak to my team about this when we talk about personal brands. Is what you see in yourself, a lot of people don't see. And you have to just get over yourself. <laughs> you have to just like let that those handcuffs go because they're just getting in the way of your own success ultimately. So I totally get it. It's like, just do it. Just get on. Just start somewhere and build it out from there. Brilliant. Um so just to kind of summarize, because that's a wrap on our session today, we've spoken about um, to be niche in your proposition, to pick a specific location and build it out from there. I loved what Darren was saying earlier on about just be confident that UK recruiters are some of the best recruiters globally. So you will resonate well in that US market. Also in terms of just building out your LinkedIn profile around that niche and then writing your content on that making sure your website talks to the target audience as well. So it's all pointing towards what your specialism is in that market. And then I loved as well, Darren, we spoke about finding out where your target audience hangs out and then comment on their posts, like them, answer any threads, you know, whether that be on Reddit and ultimately be part of that community and be famous for what your niche and proposition is. So that really is a wrap. Thank you for everything, Darren, everything that you've shared. It's been super useful and highly valuable. And if you're listening, you're excited by what you've heard, but maybe you want to understand a little bit more, you might want to talk about the US market in general, or maybe you've got um, some specific marketing questions that you'd love to ask Darren or myself, please reach out to either of us on LinkedIn. More than happy to come back um, to any direct messages that we receive um, but also we're going to play a short uh, video now and there'll also be a QR code on the screen if you'd like to book in a session with one of the team at PGC. We'd be more than happy to answer your questions on a call. But thanks all for listening. Thank you, Darren, again. Take care and we'll see everybody next time for our next episode. Thank you. Want to help backing out your US expansion? Visit us at www.pgcgroup.com to learn more or schedule a free U.S. expansion opportunity session with one of our consultants.